remain standing for the gospel lesson. It, can be, it comes from Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13, and it can be found on page 95 of the New Testament in your pew Bible. Now hear this reading from the Holy Scripture. Then Jesus said to his disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you can be my manager no longer. Then the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master has taken this position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that, when I am dismissed as manager, people will welcome me into their homes. So summoning the master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive, of olive oil. And he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, How much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is a reading from, from Holy Scripture for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. You may be seated. I also want to remind you that those pa if you're not going to be here for the fellowship luncheon at noon today, those packets are available in the narthex, and there'll be someone there to, to pass those out uh, with your name on it following this service today and next week so that we can uh, have those in the hands of the, the members of this congregation. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Gather us together, Lord, that your word might come through these words and our songs and our prayers that your connection with us might be known and felt and lived. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I think this is the most difficult parable in the Bible that Jesus spoke. I think if you were listening to it, I hope that you were as perplexed as I have been all of my adult life trying to figure out what's going on with this. This is just weird. I, I reminded of that line that is in the Disciple Bible study concerning the book of Job where the presenter there, William Abram, said, well, if you understand the book of Job, let's just say you're doing better than most. I think the same is true about this parable today. If you understand the parable of the dishonest manager, let's just say you're doing better than most. It's perplexing. Uh, Bunny read us this story. I'll give you a brief summary. The, the manager was going to be dismissed by the owner, and he was told to bring an accounting in. In other words, he was given his notice, his, his pink slip, and the, the time was coming when he'd no longer be a manager there, and he said, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm too weak to work, and I'm too proud to beg. Well, I'll use the only resource that I have that I know of, which is I'll go to each one of the owner's debtors and I'll, I'll cut a deal with them. 
I'll make things better so that after I'm dismissed, then the homes that I've given a deal to, maybe they'll, they'll be my friends. They'll welcome me there. So he does that. A uh, hundred jars of olive oil. Well, make that 50. A hundred uh, containers of wheat. Make that 80. He goes to these different people that owe the owner money. It's called the dishonest manager for a good reason because this is money owed the manager. And then, then it, it, it really gets worse. It, it, the manager, the owner finds out what the manager has done and the manager is commended by the owner for being shrewd. Being shrewd. Uh, is Jesus commending people for being dishonest it looks like that and then he goes on to say if you've been faithful with little you'll be faithful with much and if you've been dishonest with little you'll be dishonest with much well what does that have to do with stealing money from the dis from the owner by the dishonest manager and you can't serve two masters you'll hate the one and love the other you can't serve both god and worldly wealth it's just weird. I, I use the phrase for the sermon title, totally weird. What sense are we supposed to make out of this? There's a good reason that one of the greatest theo theologians, if not the greatest theologian in the whole history of Christendom, St. Augustine said, I can't believe our Lord really said this. Um, but let me take a run at it. In 2007... The New York Yankees were in a pennant race with the Tampa Bay Rays. Derek Jeter was the, the captain of the New York Yankees baseball team, and he was at bat. The Tampa, Ray Bay, Tampa Bay Rays pitcher threw the ball inside to Derek Jeter, and he dodged out of the way, but it, it managed to tick his bat, only Jeter dropped his bat and grabbed his arm and flexed his hand and, and grimaced as if he had been hit. Now everybody, in well a lot of people, knew that he had not been hit, including the, the, the people that were announcing the game. And the replay showed it hit his bat, not his arm. In the locker room after the game, Derek Jeter said, yep, I pulled a fast one on the ump who awarded him first base for being hit by a pitch. Yeah, it hit my bat. It didn't hit my arm. Well, the radio and television talk shows just exploded with, with a conversation about Derek Jeter. Was he being dishonest or was he being shrewd? Some of you will have watched the the U.S. Open tennis tournament last Sunday afternoon when Novak Djokovic clearly had a cramps. And he took a medical timeout that he was not allowed to do. You can't take a medical timeout at all for cramps, but he took a medical timeout which is only allowed when you have an acute medical emergency and had his toes worked on so that he could drink liquids. Well, he, he lost the match. Uh, and, and I was pulling for him to that point, but it's like, no, that's just wrong. He was being dishonest. He wasn't, shrewd doesn't count. That's not good enough. And that's what I think this story is about. It's not us interpreting the story. It's the story interpreting us. It gets inside of us. It's bothersome. Um. Let me give you another way of looking at this, a way to frame this. Do we look at God in our lives as a grown-up encouraging us to be grown-ups? Or do we look at God as our heavenly parent calling us to receive the love of the parent and be able to give that to others? Which one is it? 
You see, if God's a grown-up, it works like this. If God's a grown-up, then we are to learn to go and do likewise. Learn what the rules are. Learn what the expectations are, the responsibilities. You know, the things I learned in kindergarten, that great book, um, learn to be responsible. Clean up after yourself. Do the things you're supposed to do. If God is a grown-up, then we are to go and do likewise. We're to learn to be grown-ups ourselves, right? That's a way of looking at the way God is at work in the world. And, and we're in church today. Of course we're supposed to learn to be grown-ups, and we are supposed to learn to be grown-ups. But is that our only way of looking at God at work in the world? Is that the main way? You see, the 16th chapter of Luke follows on the heels of the 15th chapter, that great 15th chapter. And remember Emily's sermon, the scripture last week, which started out with the phrase, the scribes and Pharisees were grumbling at Jesus, complaining that he was welcoming sinners and eating with them. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're the grown-ups, and often we are the grown-ups. And, and those sinners and tax collectors, they're the ones that haven't gone and done likewise. They haven't learned the message. And so Jesus tells them these three parables. There was a, one lost sheep, 99 were found, one was lost. And the shepherd went out and found that sheep. One coin was lost, and the woman turned the house upside down looking for the one coin that was lost and then had a party because it was found. And then there's that prodigal son, certainly not a grown-up, who squandered all of his resources and went away and came to his senses and said, maybe I can just live better than I am now by going to my father's house. And the father threw him a party, and the the elder brother that would read the grown-up in the house that was the grown-up in training. The elder brother, well, he threw a fit because it's like, how can you, how can you throw him a party? He doesn't deserve a party. He's no grown-up. He's not, he's not been responsible. He's not done the things he's supposed to do. So that looms in the background, that story of the 15th chapter, those stories, is God a grown-up calling us to be grown-ups or is God a parent like the father who welcomed the prodigal son back home no matter what you've done does something happen for those of us that have the privilege of being parents there's something that kicks in that we never knew before when you have that child the love of a parent for a child it's so much more than anything we can imagine. Not go and do likewise. Sure, we want our children to be grown-ups and to be responsible, but, but as a parent, there's something bigger and higher and more important. There's this so much more than experience of love in our lives for our child, for our children, something we'd never experienced before. And that's the kind of love that God has for us. Every way we know how to say it, every story, everything in our worship service is about this enormous love of God for us. Yes, we're supposed to be grown-ups, but it's this grace and love of God. No matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter how glad we've blown it, this love of God, this mercy, this grace is available for us. And that's the context for our parable today of the dishonest manager. Sure, he's not a grown-up. We don't want to go around encouraging people to, to steal from others, and that's really what he's done. But see, that calls me to recognize, you know, I'm looking at this story more as a grown-up than as a parent. <laughs> I'm seeing not what's going on in the God scheme of things, but in the human. I'm applying human principles to this. Um, some of you are involved in Adam Hamilton's new book, uh, Half-Truths, the sixth chapter in there. 
we're doing it on Wednesday. The Joy Sunday School class is doing it. The seekers are going to start doing it. Half truths, things that are not in the Bible, that, but they're, they're halfway truth. And the sixth chapter says, love the sinner but hate the sin. Folks, I've said that a lot of times. I believe that. But that's my grown-up approach to where God, what God is doing in the world. I'm, I'm becoming like a Pharisee or a, a scribe or an elder brother. Love the sinner. Matt, um, Adam Hamilton said that much is true. That's, that's good. That's, that's what God would have us know. But hate the sin, you got to be really careful because hate the sin can come across as judging that person, being above that person, being better than that person. You see, that's what I'm doing when I read the dishonest manager. I'm, a, I'm applying my own understanding. And when the parable says you can't serve both worldly wealth or human understandings and God is calling us to, to recognize there's something bigger going on. It's called the first commandment. Are we going to love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength? Are we going to see that parent love that God has for us and be able to respond back to it? Not because just God calls us to be responsible and ethical, but because God calls us into a life of love. Here's the best good news that there is infinite mercy and love and forgiveness is available to each one of us it's not weird it's the best news there is come and get it it's yours for the having and the living this day our closing hymn is hymn number 438, Fourth in Thy Name. As we sing the first and last verses, if there are any here who would unite with this church, I invite you to come forward for all of us as we sing this. May this be our, our act of dedication, our, our awareness of God's love for us, and our willingness to go forward from this place who recognizing that God has made us first and we might be first. And we might treat one another as God's own beloved. Let us stand as we're able and sing number 438, fourth in thy name, the first and last verses. Eternal life is available for each of us, all of us, and for God's world now and always. Go forth from this place as God's own. And may the power and the peace and the presence of God Almighty go with you and guide you this day and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.